energy resources and transfer. The section covers energy transfer, work power and energy, and electromagnetic effects. First, energy transfer. One familiar form of energy you need to know about is heat energy. Heat, or thermal energy, is transferred in three ways. By conduction, by convection, and by radiation. Watch this clip and spot which kind of heat transfer is taking place. Energy can be released as heat. So when we say how hot something is, what we're really talking about is the amount of energy it has. Now, energy always flows from a hotter area to a cooler one. This metal bar is covered in a special material that changes colour when it gets hot. The energy is transferred from the water to the bottom of the bar so it gets hotter. And the changing colours show the energy transferring along the metal. But what is actually happening? Particles in a solid are vibrating all the time. How much depends on how hot they are. More energy means more vibration. The metal bar is heated at the bottom and the energy moves from one particle to the next, making each in turn vibrate faster. The energy always moves from hot areas to cooler ones. That clip was about conduction. We saw how heat is transferred from where there is more to where there is less. During conduction, heat moves through a material from a warmer to a colder part. Heat can also be conducted from a warmer material to a different colder material if they're in contact. This explains why a glass of iced water feels cold. Your warm hand is losing heat by conduction to the cold glass. But how can heat be conducted without movement of the material itself? Well, when part of a metal becomes hot, the atoms vibrate more rapidly. They have more kinetic energy. They pass the energy onto other atoms they touch, which in turn vibrate more rapidly. Metal atoms also have fast-moving outer electrons, which can move through the whole structure and quickly pass the energy throughout the metal. Good conductors of heat are materials that allow heat to travel easily and quickly through them. All metals are good conductors of heat, which is why metal spoons in hot liquid or metal saucepan handles quickly get too hot to touch. Insulators are poor conductors of heat, materials that do not allow heat to pass through them easily. Plastics, glass and wood are examples of good insulators. Convection is another way that heat travels from one place to another. If you have a heater on one side of the room, the heat gradually spreads throughout the room. How does this work? The air around the heater gets hot. It expands, becomes less dense and rises. Colder air sinks and moves in to take its place and is, in turn, heated. This movement of air forms circular convection currents. So convection transfers heat by the movement of particles. Convection, therefore, only takes place in liquids and gases, where the particles are free to move. Warmer parts of a liquid or gas gain more energy, expand, become less dense and rise, while colder parts fall. This creates convection currents within the liquid or gas. Radiation is the transfer of energy through empty space. Radiation doesn't need any material to travel through. It can travel through a vacuum. The sun's energy warms the Earth after travelling through space. Radiant energy, or infrared, is emitted as electromagnetic waves from objects. All objects give off some heat radiation, and the hotter the object, the more heat radiation it gives off. When an object absorbs radiant energy, it becomes hotter. The amount of radiation emitted or absorbed by an object also depends on its surface. Silvery and white surfaces are good at reflecting radiation, poor at absorbing it, and poor at giving it off. 
dull dark or black surfaces are not good at reflecting radiation and are good at absorbing it. They're also better at emitting radiation. Buildings in hot countries are painted white, so they reflect heat radiation from the sun and keep cool. We also wear white clothes in the summer. So light, shiny surfaces are poor emitters and poor absorbers of radiant heat, and dull, dark surfaces are good emitters and good absorbers of radiant heat. To sum up the transfer of heat energy, we feel the heat of a fire in all three ways directly by radiation, through hot air rising by convection, and by conduction through the ground or the fire surround. This is a cross-section of a vacuum flask. It can keep things inside it cool or hot, so it's designed to stop heat escaping from or getting into the flask. Use what you know about how heat travels to work out how it works. Well, heat can travel in three ways, by conduction, by convection and by radiation, and a vacuum flask uses several tricks to stop all three. The screw top stops convection from hot liquids through the neck of the flask, and the stopper is plastic, a good insulator, so that stops conduction. The inner container has a shiny surface to reduce heat loss or heat gain by radiation. There's also a vacuum between the two skins of the inner flask that stops heat travelling by convection and conduction. The cork pad supporting the inner flask is a good insulator, so it reduces conduction. Energy exists in many different forms. It can change from one form to another and can be moved about, but is never used up or lost, made or destroyed. The total amount of energy stays the same. That's the law of conservation of energy. As you watch the next clip, note down as many different forms of energy as you can and how they change from one form to another. We live our lives surrounded by energy. It's easy to see the effects of energy, but it's much more difficult to say exactly what energy is. Yet it's energy that is powering our everyday lives and shaping our civilization. But how we came to understand energy in all its complexity and how we put it to work in our everyday lives is one of the greatest detective stories in the history of science. So, what precisely is energy? How can we define something that appears in so many different forms? Sometimes it's locked away as chemical energy. You have to burn diesel to release its energy. That reaction can power machines like diesel generators, which convert mechanical energy into a more convenient form, electrical energy. A similar kind of chemical reaction is happening inside us when we exert some muscular energy. Sound is also a form of energy transmitted by molecular vibrations that can travel, for example, through air. But where does energy come from and where does it go to? Well, sometimes we can see it being handed on from one object to another. The story of how all these energy conversions and transfers take place is without a beginning or an end, but the total energy in the system is always constant, always conserved. This swing boat has two types of mechanical energy, kinetic energy from its motion and gravitational energy due to the pull of gravity. At the extreme end of each swing, it's all gravitational. As it passes through its lowest point, its kinetic energy is at a maximum. 
In between, one form is gradually converted to the other, but at any time the sum of the two is always constant. But in practice, this interconversion of energy isn't 100% efficient. To keep the swing boat moving, there has to be a continual supply of energy. Cut off the supply and the boat slows down. So if the energy can't be destroyed, where has it gone to? A clue might come from the fact that the bearings and the brakes are hot. So you might have spotted chemical energy stored in fuel, food, muscles or batteries, electrical energy that can travel in wires, radiant energy such as light, infrared or ultraviolet, and sound energy. We also saw kinetic energy in the things that were moving, potential or gravitational energy stored in the objects when they are lifted, and heat or thermal energy. The clip also showed how energy could change from one form to another. The kinetic energy of the giant swing becomes extra potential energy at the top of its swing, and the potential energy becomes kinetic energy again at the bottom. The energy stored in the fuel powers the generators, which work the lights and motors. If you didn't quite get that, here's another clip about energy transfer. Now what energy transfers are going on here? The bucket fills with water. High up, it has potential energy. When it's heavy enough, it starts to fall. As it comes down, the potential energy transfers to movement or kinetic energy in the wheel. As the wheel turns, kinetic energy is transferred to this dynamo. It also produces sound and a bit of heat too. The dynamo transfers kinetic energy into electricity. And the radio transfers the electricity to sound and some heat. So the whole system is mainly a transfer of potential energy and kinetic energy. Now only 6% of the potential energy the bucket had is going to the radio. So it's not very efficient, but it's very useful. A good way of showing how energy changes is with an energy flow diagram. If you put the energy converting process, like an electric cooker, in a box, you can show the energy input coming in from one side and the energy output going out on the other side. In the case of the electric cooker, the energy input is electricity and the energy output is heat and some light. How could you extend this flow diagram backwards? What comes before the electric cooker? The energy conversion process that produces the electricity for the cooker is the power station. It uses chemical energy from coal, oil, gas or nuclear energy, or the power of falling water. Look out for some more energy flow diagrams in this next clip. What are the energy flows involved when squash player Kathy hits the ball against the wall? The first link in our energy trail is from the moving squash ball to Cassie. Cassie got her energy from food, and that came from plants. Plants store energy from sunlight, so the source of the energy in the moving squash ball is the sun. Here's another example. For the bike to move, we needed to put in some fuel. There's masses of energy stored in petrol. The bike transfers the stored energy in the petrol into active energy. The bike moves and the mud flies. Some of the energy is transferred into sound. After the race, parts of the bike are still hot and that heat will be transferred into the air as it cools. Let's go back to the power station and see how good it is at converting energy from one form to another. Our main use of coal is to burn it in power stations like this one, Drax in North Yorkshire. 
The energy in the coal is used to generate electricity. The electricity is delivered to where it's needed along a grid of cables. Every day, Drax consumes 33 trainloads of coal. That's a bag of coal burnt in the time it takes to snap your fingers. The amount of energy transferred at power stations is awe-inspiring. This one turbine generates enough electricity for a city the size of Leeds. And there are six of them at Drax, enough for a tenth of our electricity. But there is a drawback. It comes as a surprise to most people to learn that most of the energy that comes into the power station goes to waste. Only about 35% of the energy that's released from burning coal actually goes into the electrical cables that supply our homes, schools and factories. The other 65% ends up as waste heat. That's not because the designers and the engineers haven't done their job well. Apart from being the largest, this is one of the cleanest and most efficient coal-fired power stations in Europe. The clip said that Drax was 35% efficient. What does that mean? All the energy stored in the coal is converted into some other form of energy. No energy is lost. It's just that by the time the coal has been burned, the water heated, the turbines and generators turned, only 35% of the original energy is transferred to the consumer as useful electricity. 65% is wasted as heat that goes into the surroundings. So the efficiency of an energy conversion process is the proportion of energy input that is made available as useful energy output. As a fraction, efficiency is useful energy output divided by energy input, times 100 if you want it as a percentage. Efficiency also depends on what you mean by useful energy and wasted energy. A normal electric light bulb produces 10% light energy and 90% heat energy. So as a light, which is what we want, it's a miserable 10% efficient. If we wanted it as a heater, it would be a fantastic 90% efficient. Here's a story about how the BBC uses the heat wasted from generating power. Television Centre, the headquarters of the BBC in West London, it's rather like an airport or a hospital in that it's a building that never sleeps. At any time of the day or night, there are people here working. Over 5,000 people work in this building. They need heat and ventilation. And then, of course, there's food. The people need to eat, and these kitchens provide over 2,000 meals every day. And this building's more like a small town in terms of the energy it uses. <laughs> The energy to keep all of these people warm in the winter and cool in the summer costs another third of a million pounds in heating and air conditioning. But that's about to change. The BBC is the latest in a growing number of companies which have decided that the best way to provide all their energy is to bring the power station to where the energy is needed. Inside this box is a mini power station. At this end is a jet engine filled by gas. Just like with a normal power station, it's the engine that turns the generator and the generator that actually makes the electricity. That's here at this end. But that's where the similarities with a normal power station stop. At the back of the machine is a special pump. It takes all of the heat that might otherwise go to waste and uses it to provide warmth, hot water and air conditioning for the whole building. The system is called Combined Heat and Power, or CHP. There are no cooling towers here. Much more of the energy is used. There's even some heat to spare, and that could be piped into these houses nearby. By pensioning off the old boilers, the BBC will be cutting its energy bill almost in half. But the best thing is that 80% of the energy that comes into the building in the gas pipes is turned by this machine into usable energy. And remember that in a coal-fired power station, 35% is considered good going. So with the combined heat and power plant, about 35% of the input energy goes into generating useful electrical power, and another 45% goes to making useful heat, now leaving only 20% wasted an overall efficiency of around 80%. 
Remember, energy transfers usually produce more than one form of output energy, not just the useful output we're looking for, because overall, no energy is lost or gained by the transfer. There's more about energy transfer in the physics section of the higher tier program. That's the end of this section on energy transfer. Now, let's see what we mean by work, power and energy. When you lift a weight, you do some work. The energy transferred from the weightlifter to the weights can be measured by the work done. The work done lifting the weights depends on the size of the force and the distance the force moves. There's an equation for this, which is work done equals force times distance. The unit of measurement for energy and work done is the joule. The work done in joules equals the force in newtons times the distance in meters. When the weightlifter lifts the weight, he's using his muscles to transfer energy from the food into extra potential energy in the weights when they're off the ground. The force he uses is equal to the pull of gravity on the weights. That's the mass in kilograms times the gravitational field strength, g. The distance he moves the weights is the height lifted in meters. So the work the weightlifter does, the energy transferred, is equal to the mass of the weights times g times the height lifted. There's more about work, power and energy in the physics section of the higher tier program. That's the end of work, power and energy. This section is about electromagnetic effects. Electricity, magnetism and movement are all linked. First, let's remind ourselves about the properties of magnets. As you watch the next clip, note down some of the properties of magnets and magnetic fields. A magnet doesn't have to be touching whatever it's attracting, like this paper clip. The force of the magnet can be sensed all around the magnet, and this space of attraction is called the magnetic field. Now, the magnetic field is invisible to our eyes, so how do we see it? Well, these small pieces of iron are called iron filings, and they line up in the shape of the magnetic field. And where the lines are closest is where the force is strongest the ends of the magnet, at the poles. This is only part of the picture. Magnetic force doesn't just work in air. The iron filings have been mixed with oil. And drop in the magnet. We can see the shape of the magnetic field all around the magnet. The iron filings are closest together at the poles, and that's where the magnetic field is strongest. Further away from the magnet, the filings are wider apart, and that shows that the magnetic force decreases the further away you are from a magnet. We saw that magnets can exert a force on magnetic materials without touching them, so magnetism is a field force, not a contact force. The area around a magnet where the magnetic force acts is called a magnetic field. Lines of force point away from the North Pole towards the South Pole. Lines of force are closer together where the field is stronger and further apart where the field is weaker. Opposite poles attract each other while like poles repel each other. So, what's the link between magnetism and electricity? As you watch the next clip, work out what's happening. The battery makes a small current that lights up a bulb. But the current also makes a magnetic field. It's just strong enough to push the needle on this compass, but only just. This battery is a lot bigger. Although it makes about the same voltage, 
it can send a much bigger current down this wire to work the van's starter motor. Even so, the magnetic field made by the big current is only just strong enough to push these iron filings into line. When a current passes through the wire, it produces a magnetic field around the wire. This is called the electromagnetic effect. When the current flows in one direction, a magnetic field circles around the wire in one direction. When the current is reversed, the magnetic field circles around the wire in the other direction. When the current is switched off, the magnetic field stops. This can cause practical problems. Can you think of places where electrical cables might pass close to magnets? Tally ho, pass me the good old compass. So where's the problem? Well, Harry, the problem is in these instruments here that are all electrical. And the electrical current that goes through the cable gives off a magnetic field that deflects the compass. Well, I can't detect anything. You can't detect it because none of this is turned on. Look. Ah. Oh, yes. I see it now. So why can't we insulate against that? Well, you can insulate the cables against electricity from leaking, but you can't insulate the cables from magnetic fields. So how do you correct a compass that's pointing in the wrong direction? Well, that's easy, Harry. What we use are permanent magnets like these, and we put them around the compass to deflect the compass card back to its true position. So pull it round. That's right, yes. So let's say, for the sake of argument, nick your magnet, that um, this is an electrical cable producing a magnetic field, and it's pulling the compass round. OK, I'll take another magnet, and I'll put it on the other side, and allow it to pull it back to its true heading. That's clever. So the magnetic field created by a current flowing through an electrical cable can interfere with plane and also ship's compasses unless it's corrected. Another example is when the magnetic field around an electrical cable causes a humming sound in a loudspeaker. This electromagnetic effect can be put to good use to make an electromagnet. If the wire is made into a coil, the current flowing through it creates a magnetic field that is the same as around a bar magnet. It's an electric magnet. When the current is switched off, the magnetic field disappears. A coiled wire like this is called a solenoid. Can you think of ways of increasing the strength of the magnetic field in the coil? Let me see. It says here that I can increase the strength of the magnetic field by wrapping the wire into a coil. Well, I've done that. Magnetic field's not strong enough. You can increase the magnetic field by putting something into the coil. Plastic. That's not really effective. Uh, what about this? Iron. Now, that's better, but it's still not strong enough. Um... Now, another way to increase the strength of the magnetic field is to use more than one coil, and bringing the ends together is even better. It's certainly having some effect, but there's still room for improvement. Larger electrical current through the coils. Can't do that. Larger coils. Can do that. So, now I've got a magnet that I can switch on and off as needed. So, the strength of the magnetic field in the coil can be increased by increasing the number of turns in the coil, increasing the flow of current, or placing a soft iron rod or core inside the coil. Soft iron is used for the core because it becomes magnetic as soon as the current is switched on and loses its magnetic effect as soon as the current is switched off. A magnet that can be turned on and off like this is called an electromagnet. Watch the next clip carefully for another explanation of how they work. Electromagnets are really just coils of wire. It's easiest to see how one works away from the machine. 
Put a steel plunger inside the coil, then pass a current through the coil and the plunger gets pulled in magnetically. It takes very little current to do this because the hundreds of turns of wire magnify the magnetic effect strongly. The magnetic field from one turn of wire is weak, but add more turns and now there are many wires side by side, each carrying the same current in the same direction. So there's many times the magnetic field. The more turns, the stronger the field. Here's a circuit diagram of an electric bell. When the current flows in the circuit, it passes through the coil of an electromagnet. The bell hammer is attached to a piece of springy metal, which is part of the circuit. Have a go at explaining exactly how the electric bell works. If you get a question like this, you need to explain exactly what happens in the correct order. Something like this. When the current is switched on, it flows in the wire coil. That creates a magnetic force which attracts the bell hammer and clangs the bell. It also breaks the circuit, which turns off the electromagnet and releases the hammer so it springs back into its original position. That turns the current on again, which turns on the electromagnet, and so on, very quickly. This is what you might have written. Another useful application of an electromagnet is in a relay. A relay is a switch that's operated by an electromagnet. They're often used for safety reasons to operate switches at a distance from the operator. They can also use a small current to control a large current. When a small current flows in the relay, it activates the electromagnet. That pulls the large switch closed, which lets a larger current flow into the other circuit. When the small current in the relay is switched off, it releases the electromagnet. That opens the large switch, which stops the larger current. Even if you don't get a bell or a relay in your exam, knowing how they work should help you deal with any other questions about electromagnets in action. There's more about electromagnetic effects in the physics section of the Higher Tier Science Programme. That's the end of the whole section on energy resources and transfer.